I'm sure many of y'all have already heard of the uh, molecule DNA, and it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. I wrote it out ahead of time to, to spare you the pain of watching me spell this in real time. But it is, and I think you already have an idea of this, it's the basic unit of heredity, or it's, it, it allow, it's what codes all of our genetic information. And what I want to do in this video, because I think that's kind of common knowledge, that's popular knowledge, that, oh, you know, everything that, you know, what makes my hair black or my eyes blue or, or, or whatever, that's all somehow encoded in our DNA. But what I want to do in this video is give you an idea of how something like DNA, a molecule, can actually code for what we are. How, how does the information, one, get stored in this type of a molecule, and then how does that actually turn into the proteins that make up our enzymes and our organs and our brain cells and everything else that, that really make us us. So this is a, a computer uh, a graphics representation of DNA. And I'm sure many of y'all have heard of the double helix double helix. And that's a reference to the structure that DNA takes. And you can see here, it's a double helix. It's a, as you can see here, you have two of these lines, and they're intertwined each other. You see there, that's one of them. And then you see another one in, intertwined like that. And then they're connected by, you can almost view as, it's like these bridges between the two, between the two helixes, and they twist around uh, each other. And I think you get the idea. And so the double helix just describes the, the structure, the shape that DNA takes. And it, ha it leads to all sorts of interesting repercussions in terms of how heredity takes place and, 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 and how natural selection and variation might take place as well. And actually, in the future, I do want to actually read with you the, the uh, Watson and Crick's paper on the double helix, where they essentially, you know, talk about their discovery. And the best thing about that paper, besides the fact that it was probably one of the biggest discoveries in the history of mankind, is that the paper is only a page and a half long. And it, it goes to my general view that if you have something good to say, it shouldn't take you that long to say it. But with that said, let's think a little bit about how this can actually generate the proteins and whatever else that, that make up all of us. So right here, this is a, a zoomed up version of that, of that of that graphic that I just showed you a little bit earlier. And this is each of the helixes. So if you know this is the magenta side, if you unwound this helix, right now it shows it in kind of its wound state, but if I unwind this helix, I'd get one side would maybe be maybe be this magenta side of our helix. And then one side is this green side, right? And if you twist it up, you get back to this drawing up here. And then these bridges that you see in this drawing, in the double helix, those are these connections right here. These are the bridges. These are the bridges. Now, what allows us to, to code information is that the makeup, the blocks that, that make up the bridges are made of different molecules. And the four different molecules that are made up in DNA are adenine, and it's written here on this little chart. I got all of this from Wikipedia, so if you want more information, I encourage you to go there. Adenine, they do that. That's up here. This is the molecular structure of adenine. It's connected to a sugar right here, ribose. I, I won't go into a deoxyribose. That's where it comes. And then you have your phosphate group. But these kind of form the the backbone of the DNA, the sugar and the phosphate groups. And I'm not going to go into the microbiology of it, because that's not important right now for understanding just how does this intuitively code for what we are. So you have, but along the backbone, which is identical, and we'll talk about, they run in different directions. It's called anti-parallel. So if you, this is, they label the ends. And I'm not going to go into detail there. But the important thing is, is are these, these bases here. So you have adenine, and adenine pairs with thymine. Adenine pairs with thymine. And you see that up here. If you have an adenine molecule here, on, on um, adenine base here, it'll pair with thymine. This is called the base pair. Adenine and thymine pair with each other. If you have thymine, it's going to pair with adenine. And then you have guanine, and it pairs with cytosine. So guanine. Guanine and it pairs with cytosine. And the names of these, you should know these names just because they are almost, um, well, if you ever enter any discussion about, about DNA and base pairs, this is you know, 
expected knowledge. But the, the, the names of the molecules and how they're structured, we not important just yet. But what's important is is the fact that there are four of them and that they are they essentially code information. So you can view the one of these strands in kind of a simplified way. You can just see view it as a strand of so this one if I it has an adenine adenine and then it has a cytosine has a cytosine, then it has a guanine. It's a guanine they did it in purple. And then it has a I don't know, it has a thymine, not a guanine. So it has a thymine in purple, and then in blue it has a guanine. So this this strand right here codes A, C, T, G. And if you were to code the opposite side of the strand, you could immediately, I don't even have to look here. I can look at this side and say, OK, adenine will pair with thymine, guanine, cytosine pairs with, with guanine, thymine pairs with adenine, and guanine pairs with cytosine. So they're complementary strands. So if you think about it, they're really coding the same thing. If you have one of them, you have all of the information for the other. Now, in our DNA, in a in a in a human's DNA, so you might say, hey, you know, Sal, how do I go from how do I go from these little, you know, little chains of these molecules? And yeah, I mean it's like you know, how does that turn into me? How does that turn into this complex organism? And the simple answer is, is well, you have the human genome has three billion of these base pairs. Three billion. Three billion base pairs. And that's actually just in half of your chromosomes. And I'll tell you uh, maybe in this video or a future video why we only consider half of your chromosomes. And that's because uh, essentially uh, all of you have two pair, you have a pair of, of every chromosome. I'll, I'll talk more in more detail about that. And this number, to some people, they might say, I'm only, it only takes three billion pieces of, you know, uh, three billion base pairs to describe who I am. And to some people would say, wow, I, it takes three billion base pairs to describe who I am. I never thought I was that complex. So depending on your point of view, this is either a large or a small number. But when you take these three billion base pairs, you're actually encoding all of the information that it takes to make in this case, a human being, and actually it turns out uh, a lot of primates don't have that many different base pairs than human beings. And if you, if you were, it's actually what the, the amazing thing is even things like roundworms and fruit flies also number in the, uh, well, a, a, a surprisingly large fraction of the base pairs of a human being. I won't go, maybe I'll do a, a, another video where I go into comparative biology. But how does this, how does these, these base pairs actually lead to proteins? I mean, it's fair enough, that's information. It's like you can view these as ones and zeros in some type of computer language, but really they're not just ones and zeros because they can take on four different values. They can take on you know a a, a t, a c, or a g. So you could think of them as zero, ones, twos, and threes. But I won't go into the, that whole aspect of it just now. So how does that actually code code information? So DNA, when it actually transcribes transcribes something, it's the the process is called transcription. Let me do a transcription. And I'm going to do a pretty gross simplification of it, but I think it'll give you the gist of how it codes for proteins. So what happens when transcription happens is that these two strands split up. And one of the strands, let me just take one of them. Let's say it looks like this. I'll do it all in one color. Let's say it's just, just A, T, G, G, A, C, G. I'm just making up stuff. T. A. Let's say that that's the strand that got split up, and what happens is it it, it transcribes it, and I won't say uh, itself. There's there's a whole bunch of enzymes and proteins, and it's a you know a whole uh, bunch of chemical reactions that have to happen. But this DNA essentially transcribes a complementary mRNA, an mRNA, and I'll introduce RNA that RNA. It's essentially the exact same thing as, well, the word is ribonucleic acid. So it's literally, you get rid of the deoxy, so you can kind of say it's got its oxy, and it's ribonucleic acid. But it's very similar to DNA. It codes in the exact same way. And the only difference between RNA, instead of a thymine, instead of a thymine, it has something called a uracil. A uracil. So every place where you would have expected a thymine, it'll have. Uh, you would have expected a T. You'll now see a U. So for example, this if this is the DNA strand, then a 
RNA and mRNA, a messenger RNA strand, will be built complementary to this. So it'll be built, let's see, with A, you'd have, normally have thymine when you're talking DNA, but now we're talking RNA, so it'll be a uracil, then an adenine, cytosine, cytosine, let's see, uracil, then we got a guanine, a cytosine, a, an adenine, and then we'll have a uracil. And so this is the mRNA strand here. And all of this is occurring inside the nucleus, the nucleus of your cells. And we'll do a whole series of videos in the future about the the structure uh, of of our, our of our cells. But I think most of us know that our cells, and I'll talk more about eukaryotic and prokaryotic organisms in the future. But most complex organisms, they have a cell nucleus where we have all of our chromosomes that contain all of our DNA. And so this mRNA, then detaches itself from the DNA that it was transcribed from and then it leaves the nucleus and it goes to these structures called ribosomes and I'm you know I'm oversimplifying a little bit but at the ribosomes this mRNA is translated into proteins so let me do that so let's say this is so this is the mRNA it was transcribed from that DNA so let me get rid of that DNA now yeah, I got rid of the DNA. This is the mRNA that we were able to transcribe from that DNA. And it, they have these other things called tRNA, or transfer RNA. And what these are, and this is, this is the really interesting part. So you may or may not know that you know pretty much everything we are is made up of proteins. And these proteins, the building blocks of proteins, are amino acids. And for those of you who like to lift weights, I'm sure you've seen ads for amino acid supplements and things of the like. And the reason why they, they, they talk about amino acids is because those are the building blocks of, of proteins, amino acids. My son actually has an allergy to milk protein, so we had to get him a formula that was just pure amino acids, just all of the milk proteins broken down. So if you look at a protein, it's actually, it's actually a, it's a chain of these amino acids, and usually a fairly long chain. We'll, get, we'll look at a. We'll look at some of some protein structures in the very near future, just to give you an idea of things. It's a very long chain of these of these amino acids, and there are actually 20 different amino acids. 20 different amino acids are pretty much the structure of all of our proteins. Let me write that. 20 amino acids. Amino acids. So a very obvious question is, how can these things code for 20 different amino acids? I can only have four different things in this little bucket right here. And then you just have to go back to your combinatorics, or if you if you don't if you can't go back to it, watch the play the playlist on probability and combinatorics. You say, okay, there's only four ways that each of these that I can have uh, for each of these bases, there's only four different bases that I can have here, either an adenine, guanine, a cytosine, or depending on whether we're talking about DNA or RNA, a uracil or a thymine. But how can we increase the combinations? Well, if we if we include two of them, if we include two bases, then how what how many combinations can we have? Well, we have four possibilities here, and then we'd have four possibilities here, so we'd have 16 possibilities. But that's still not enough. That's still not enough to code for a for one of 20 amino acids to say, hey, this is going to code for amino acid number five, and we'll talk more about their actual names. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to use three of them. So three of them, there's actually four times four times four possibilities here. So they could code for 64 different things. They could take on 64 different combinations or permutations, this UAC right here. So if we have three of these bases, we can actually code for an amino acid. Well, actually, it's overkill, because we can actually have 64 combinations here, and there are only 20 amino acids. So we can even have redundant combinations code for different amino acids. For example, we might say that, you know, let's say, and I, this isn't the actual code, but maybe UAC, and I should look these up, this codes for amino acid number one. And if it was U A or let's say A A U, this codes for amino acid number two. And if we have, let me see, if I have, I mean, I think you get the idea. If I have G G G, this codes for amino acid number ten. And what happens is when this messenger RNA leaves the nucleus, it goes to the ribosomes, and at the ribosomes, and we're going to look at that diagram in a in a few seconds. But at the ribosomes. Let me take my my same 
mRNA molecule. And they're much longer than what I'm showing here. This is just a fraction of an mRNA molecule. So I'll take my mRNA molecule. And what they do is they, they essentially act as a template for tRNA molecules. And tRNA molecules are these, are these molecules that, have, that are attached to the, they're almost like the trucks for the amino acids. So let's say I have some amino acid right here, and then I have another amino acid that's right here, like that, and then I have another amino acid that's like that. They'll be attached to tRNA molecules. So let's say that this tRNA molecule is, has on it, it's attached, so this amino acid is attached to a tRNA molecule that has the code on it A, let me do it in a darker color. It has the code A, U, G. And this one right here has it on, it has the code, it has, on, let's see, the code, let me pick another one. Let's say it has G, G, A, C. So what's going to happen? When you're in the ribosome, and it's a, it's a complex situation, but actually what's happening isn't too fancy, this tRNA, it wants, it's, it wants to bond to this part of the mRNA. Why? Because adenine bonds with uracil, uracil bonds with adenine, and guanine bonds with cytosine. So it'll pull up right here. It'll pull up right next to this thing. And actually, I should probably, let me see if I can, well, I don't know if I can rotate it. But I, it'll just pull up right here on, on and attach to this mRNA molecule. And this, this right here is tRNA, tRNA. This is mRNA. And the names don't matter. I really just want to give you the big picture idea of how the proteins are actually formed. And this is an amino acid. I don't know. Let's call it amino acid 1, amino acid 5, amino acid 20. This guy, he's going to pull up right here. He's the, the guanines attracted to the cytosine. And I, if you watch the chemistry videos, these are actually hydrogen bonds that form the base pairs. Adenine wants to pull up to uracil, cytosine to guanine, and so on and so forth. And so once all of these guys have pulled up, let me do that. So if, once, you, once you've pulled up, let's say that this is, I could do it up here. This is my mRNA molecule. I'm not going to draw the specifics right there. My little tRNAs pull up, pull up next to it. And they each hold a payload. Right, so this this first one holds this payload right here of this amino acid. The second one holds this payload of this amino acid, and so forth and so on. And so you know it might keep going. And there's another amino you know, green amino acid here. They really don't have those colors, but I'm just just for the sake of simplicity, like that. And then the amino acids bond to each other when they're held like that, close to each other. And this doesn't happen all by itself. The ribosome serves a purpose, and there are enzymes that facilitate this process. But once these guys bond together, the tRNA detaches. And you have this chain, this, this, this chain of amino acids. And then the chain of amino acids starts to bend around. So uh, they have all of these. And it's actually a fascinating. I mean, people have done many, you know, uh, people spend their life studying how proteins fold. And that's actually where they get most of their, their structural properties. It's not just the chain of the amino acids, but what's more important is how these amino acids actually fold. So once you fold them, they form these really ultra complex patterns based on on you know what amino acid is attracted to what other amino acids and these very intricate three-dimensional shapes and what he, what I took here from Wikipedia is these are some amino acids and just to be able to relate this to the the DNA this right here is insulin it's key in, a, in our ability to process glucose in our body so this right here is insulin. It's a hormone. So you know sometimes you pe hear people talking about your immune system. Sometimes you pe hear people talking about your endocrine system and hormones. Sometimes your digestive system. This is hemoglobin. You know, the, the essentially the what what makes uh, what essentially transports our oxygen in our blood. But all of these things are proteins. And all of these little little folds you see, these are all little amino. I mean, there's 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 just little dots of amino acids. And this is just one. Well, some of these are multiple chains of amino acids kind of fitting together like a big puzzle. But some of them are just single chains of amino acids. For like insulin right here, this is 50 amino acids. And then once the chain forms, it all it all bundles together and forms this little, this little blob like you see. But the shape of that blob is super important for insulin being able to perform the function that it needs to perform in our, in our, in our systems. But this right here is 50, approximately 50, I forgot the exact number, amino acids 
amino acids. This right here, this immunoglobul immunoglobulin G, which is part of our immune system, this is roughly 1,500. 1,500 amino acids. Amino acids. So how much DNA or how many base pairs have to code for this? Well, three times as much, right? Because it took, you have to have three base pairs that code for one amino acid. And actually, three base pairs, this is called a codon. Codon. Because it codes for amino acids. So three base pairs make a codon. So if you have 50 amino acids that make up insulin, that means you're going to have to have 50 codons, which means you have to have 150, 150 bases. Which, or 150 of these A's and G's and T's. If you have 1,500 amino acids, that means you're going to have to have 1,500 codons, which means you're going to have roughly 4,500 4, of these base pairs that code for it. Now, you might, you know, there's some notions that get confused a lot. So every, I, I went to kind of the smallest level of our DNA right here. And this is the, in, the level at which, well, this is RNA that I'm pointing to right there. But this is the smallest level of DNA, and that's the level at which the information is actually coded. But how does that relate to things like genes and chromosomes and, and things that you might talk about in, in, in other contexts? And so these base pairs, so let's say the, 50, the 150 base pairs that coded for insulin, these make up a gene, a gene. So and you know, these 450, these 4,500 base pairs make up another gene. Now, all of the genes don't make proteins, but all of the proteins are made by genes. So let's say I have just a bunch of, let me just take a bunch of, you know, I'm just making another, you know, A, G, and I, it goes down, 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 and then you have, you know, a, a, a T and then a, a C and a C, and you know, let's say I have, I don't know, 4,500 of these. These could code for a protein. These could code for a protein, or they could have all of these other kind of uh, regulatory functions telling telling what other parts of the DNA should and should not be coded, and what the, how the DNA behaves. So it becomes super super complex. But this kind of section of our DNA, this is what we refer to as a gene. This is what we refer to as a gene, and a gene can have anywhere. I mean, from a couple of hundreds of these base pairs or these bases to uh, several thousand of these base pairs. Now. A gene is that part of our chromosome that codes for a particular protein or serves a, a certain function. Now, there are different versions of genes, right? So a gene, so this could, you know, it's a gross oversimplification, but let me maybe say this is the gene for, um, this is the gene for insulin. Insulin. Now, there might be you know, slight variations in how insulin can be coded for. And I'm kind of going out of my domain right here, because I don't know if that's true. And maybe I shouldn't just speak specifically about insulin. But it's coding for some protein. But there's maybe multiple different ways that that protein can be coded. Maybe instead of a T here, sometimes there's a C there. It still codes for the same protein. It doesn't change it quite enough, but it, that protein acts just a little bit different. It introduces, it has a little bit of, it's, it's a, a slight variant, I'll use that word. Now, each variant of this gene is called an allele. Allele is a specific, specific variant, specific variant of, of, of your gene, variant of your gene. Now, if you take up, if you, you know, you take these, this, this this DNA chain and you know this this chain over here. Let's see. This is one base pair. And just so kind of you know, this might be like one base. This is another base. This is a, maybe this is an adenine, and then this would be a thymine over here in green. This is an adenine. This would be a thymine. If this is a you know if if right here this is a guanine, then right here would be a cytosine. This would be just a very small section. If I were to like zoom out, right? And let's say we have a, a big chain of DNA, where each of these little dots are a base pair that I'm drawing here. Maybe this section codes for gene 1, gene 1, maybe. And then there's some noise or things that we haven't fully understood yet. And I want to be clear, just with this simple 
discussion of DNA, we're already kind of approaching the frontiers of what we know and what we don't know. Because there's uh, the, the DNA is hugely complex, and there's all of these feedback structures, and certain genes tell you to code for other genes and not to code for other genes and to code under certain circumstances. So it's hugely complex. So there's huge sections of DNA that we still don't understand what exactly they do. But then maybe they'll have another section here that codes for gene 2. Maybe gene 2 is a little bit longer. Maybe it's a 1,000 base pairs. But when you take all of these, and you turn it into a, and then it, it, it kind of winds in on itself like this. Let me do it. So it'll wind up winding in on itself like this and do all sorts of crazy things. Remember, this is the whole, you know, it, it completely bundles itself up, and then it looks something like that. Then you get a chromosome. A chromosome. And just to get an idea of how large a chromosome is compared to compared to the actual base pairs, chromosome number one in the human genome. So we have 23 pairs. If you look at it inside of a nucleus, so let's say that's the nucleus. Let's say this is the cell. The cell is much bigger than what I'm showing. But we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. One, two, I won't do all of them. And you can actually see chromosomes in a, in a not too expensive microscope. So we're already getting to a scale that we can start to look at. But the largest chromosome, which is chromosome number one in the human genome, just to give an idea of how much information it's packing, that thing right there has 220 million base pairs. So when we're talking about, you know, sometimes people talk about chromosomes and genetics and genes and base pairs interchangeably, but it's very important to kind of get an idea of scale. These chromosomes are a super long strand of DNA that's all configured and bundled up, and it contains 220 million base pairs. So the actual elements that are coding for the information are unbelievably small relative relative to the chromosome itself. But now that we understand a little bit, and actually I want to take a look back at this, because this is what, you know, this kind of blows my mind, that if you just take our, those little combinations of those amino acids, you can form these very intricate, very advanced structures that we're still fully understanding how they actually in, uh, interact with each other and regulate how our, our, uh, all of our biological processes work. And what's even more amazing is that this, this scheme that I've talked about in this video about DNA to mRNA to tRNA to these molecules, this is true for all of life on our planet. So we all share the same mechanism. Of, you know, me and this plant, we're distant. We, we, we share that common root of that we all have DNA. As different as we, me and that you know, roach that I might not like to be in the same room. We all share that same common root of DNA and that all of it codes to proteins in this exact same way, that there's this commonality amongst all life. That, to me, is mind-blowing. And even more mind-blowing is how these very complex shapes are formed by this, you know, uh, by the DNA, and this isn't speculation. This is, I mean, you could this this is observed uh, behavior that these very, I mean, this is a fascinating structure right here. But it's just based on 20 amino acid. You can almost view the amino acid as a, as the Legos, and and you put the Legos together, and just the chemical interactions form these these fairly impressive. Uh, uh, structures right here. So now that we know a little bit about DNA and how it codes into protein, we can jump, take a little jump back and, and talk a little bit more and, uh, about how variation is actually introduced into a population.